Well, December 31st, we've made it, you've made it, congratulations. Uh, I want to mention one thing before I jump into my message for today. Uh, uh, tonight, uh, we have a uh, praise party planned, 8 o'clock, but we're canceling it. Uh, and so I just want to make you guys aware, we'll get this word out on social media, that uh, due to the weather, uh, I, I've just made the decision that, that it's something we just need to not do this year. Uh, it's going to be late in the day, uh, it'll be after midnight as people are heading home, and as you know, probably, uh, it's supposed to get pretty cold out, and we have people that drive long distances to be here, and so I don't want to put anybody in harm's way. So uh, we will not be having the praise party tonight that was originally planned. Everybody with me? All right, okay. All right, well, uh, it, it is... It is New Year's Eve. Maybe I've said Christmas Eve a couple times. I don't know if I've said that. Sometimes I slip up and say that. Sometimes I even say it's Easter when it's Christmas. Uh, but but uh, one week, a Sunday school teacher had just finished telling her class the Christmas story, and that time I meant to say Christmas. After telling the story, the teacher asked, who do you think the most important woman in the Bible is? And a little, bi- a little boy down front raised his hands, and he said, Eve. And the teacher asked him why he thought Eve was the most important woman in the Bible. And the little boy replied, well, the name, they named two days of the year after Eve. You know, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. <laughs> Some of you said, aw, that's a joke. I don't think that really happened. But. Well, it's New Year's Eve, and, uh, and I just have a few quick thoughts that I want to share with you. We've got kids in the room, and so thankful for our kids' ministry. Uh, these are days that make me even more thankful for our kids' ministry. Um, but we're so glad that the kids are with us today in the sanctuary. And, uh, and so I'm just going to share a few quick thoughts. You have no outline. You probably noticed that today. Uh, if you want to write some things down, you can do that. Maybe highlight in your Bible some scriptures we're going to go through. But I want to talk a little bit about New Year's Eve with you. Uh, I was talking with my daughter before the service. She's, she's eight years old, and, and I asked her, I said, hey, are you going to set any goals for the new year? She kind of gave me this look, and I said, well, you know, a lot of people do that. You know, we call them, we call them resolutions. And she looked at me, she said, yeah, but daddy, nobody keeps them. I said, how did you know that? She said a TV show. I'm like, okay, well, that TV show's on point, I guess. I did some research. Maybe you know this, but only 8% of people keep their New Year's resolutions. Only 8 people. I mean, out of 100 people, only 8 people keep their resolutions for the entire year. That's amazing. 8%. That means all of the people that that commit to get healthier, only 8% stick with it. All of the people that commit to save more throughout the year, only 8 out of 100 people actually follow through with that. I think, I think that's astonishing. In some ways, it's embarrassing. I looked up the list for the top uh, New Year's resolutions for this year, 2017, uh, and so maybe, maybe none of these will surprise you. These are in order of, of people that, that, that committed to them. The number one resolution that was set, anybody want to guess it? Yeah, get healthy, get healthy, right? There's been this move in, in recent years away from lose weight to get healthy. Maybe it sounds more positive to, to get something versus lose something. Uh, but yeah, get healthy is number one. Anybody want to guess what number two was? No, no. Get organized. I thought that was interesting. Get organized. Uh, number three was live life to the fullest. I'm not sure how you measure that, uh, but that's a good goal to have. Learn new hobbies. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, spend less, save more. I heard, I heard a few of you say that. Uh, number six was to travel. That's a good one. Uh, the last one that I found <coughs> was to read more. That's one that I've done before. I, set, I say I want to read one book a month or <coughs> excuse me, something like that. Uh, but maybe, maybe you right now, you're either you're on, you're on one camp or the other, you're thinking, yeah, I need, to, I need to sit down and write out some goals for myself for 2018, or maybe you're the person that says, you know, I've tried that before, I'm not going to do it this year, you can have it, I'm not going to go there. You know, a woman, she walked into her bathroom at home, and as she did, she saw her husband weighing himself on the bathroom scales, I'm sure it was... It was a few months into the new year, and as he was standing there, he, he was sucking in his stomach. And the woman thought to herself, he thinks that he'll weigh less by sucking in his stomach. Maybe you've seen your husband do that. So the woman rather sarcastically said to her husband, you know, that's not going to help. 
And he said, oh, yes, it is. It's the only way I can see the numbers on the scale. <laughs> the new year. The new year. If I have one big idea for you today, if you can grab a hold of this, I tend to think that the new year is actually an excellent time to change some things. It's an excellent time to change some things. We often find ourselves naturally thinking about the year gone by. We, 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 we find ourselves being a little more contemplative, a little bit more uh, 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 discerning about what we've done and what we've been through in the new year. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've taken inventory of 2017 and you say, yeah, you know, I, I accomplished a few things this year. It was a good year. Or maybe you would say, I ah, know, man, I, I gave up on my New Year's resolutions on January 3rd. Like, I couldn't even stick with it for three days. But the new year, it is. It's a time where we look back, but then we also can look forward. And the new year, I think it brings new opportunity for all of us. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of, of setting goals for yourself and, and kind of plotting out your new year. And, and I hope that you'll receive this entire message as a challenge, because that's how I mean it. I want to challenge all of you to take a look, take inventory of where you're at today and say, you know what, I want this new year to be a year where I get better. I want to get better in the new year. And so I think this is a great opportunity to do that. And so uh, the first point that I want to submit to you is that I think the Christian life, the Christian life is actually all about growth and change. Sometimes, sometimes we miss that thought, don't we? Sometimes we tend to think, well, I'm saved, so I'm good. Or, 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 yeah, you know, I've taken a few steps, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of good where I am right now. Far too many Christians, I would say it this way, far too many Christians simply aren't growing. They just aren't growing. They found themselves just content with where I am. They would say, nah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good right now. I go to church. I read my Bible on occasion. I'm, I'm all right. I... I've got it. I'm okay. Listen, if you aren't growing, if you aren't discovering new things about God and about yourself every year, I think that you're missing out on a large part of what it means to be a Christian. I think the Bible tells us time and time again that our lives are meant to be lives that grow over time. Lives that change over time. There are parts of us that change in an instant when we accept Christ as Savior. But there's many parts of our lives that go through a process in order to find lasting change for ourselves. I believe that every year, every year, and for some of us, every month and even every week, we are given opportunities to discover new levels of trust and of faith in God. I think we're given those opportunities every single year. Every year we are given the opportunity to fully understand and to fully receive the depth of God's grace and mercy in our lives. I think those things are available to us. But if we are stagnant, if we stay where we are, if we're not intentional about our growth process, then we can miss out on those opportunities that stand right in front of us every week, every month, and every year. Christians, we need to get this. In fact, if you set no other goal for the new year, I want to challenge you up front. Set a goal to do this whole Christian thing better. No matter where you're at, just, just commit. Just set a goal to do it better. Assess where you're at and say, these are steps I need to take to do this thing better. Better. Get better in the new year. This whole Christian thing is about change. It's about growth. We see this very clearly. One of my favorite scriptures, Romans chapter 12. Verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know, it says in these words, it says to be transformed. In other words, it's, it's kind of like this, this process of being changed. It's going through a process of becoming new. He makes all things new. For some of us, it happens in some areas of our lives in an instant, but for far Far more of us, it happens over time. I, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you, how many of you have arrived as a Christian? I would hope nobody would raise their hand. And how do we do it? How are we transformed? Well, it says it very clearly. It says, by renewing your mind. By going through this process in your life where the things you think about, the person that you are changes over time. It transforms over time. 
you begin finding yourself thinking about different things than you thought about the day before. You view life completely differently. You view yourself, you view your relationships completely differently. Because the things that you think about are changing. And how do we change the things we think about? Well, we focus our thoughts on God. We focus everything that we are on God and who He is. We, we pray. We spend time with Him. We get in His Word. We attend church. We go to small group. We focus our entire lives on who He is so that He can change who we are. That's good preaching. We've got to get this, church. We are all in a constant state of change. Growth has got to come into our lives. If you find yourself saying, well, any day that passes in your life, if you find yourself saying, I'm good. I'm as Christian as I want to be. I've got it all figured out. I'm okay. And listen, often that comes through comparing yourself to somebody else. Well, at least I don't cuss like that person. So I got it. I'm good. Well, I go to church more than that person, so I'm okay. That's not transforming your mind. That's not growing in Christ. That's not finding new levels and new depths of His grace and His mercy and His character and who He is. That's focused on what's around you. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. No, dear brothers and sisters, I am still not all I should be. Man, that's powerful. I'm still not all I should be, but I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing. And this is a good word for 2018, for today. Forgetting the past and looking for what lies ahead. Looking to what is ahead of you. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the price for which God, through Christ Jesus, has called us up to heaven or heavenward. I have still not attained it. I've still not gotten there. But how do I get there? How do I arrive? How do I, how do, I do that? Well, I, I forget what's behind me. I leave old things in the past. I don't do that anymore. I'm not around those people anymore. I don't, I don't find myself in those circles anymore. I focus myself on what's ahead. What's in front of me. And listen, if you don't set goals for yourself, how will you know what's ahead of you? Setting goals is the idea of saying, okay, God, tell me what should be ahead of me and let me write those things down because that's what I want to move toward. And even Paul says, that's what I want to strain toward. In other words, I've got to work toward those things. It's not going to come easy. I've got to work to them. I've got to strain toward them. But when I get them, when I achieve them, that's when heaven on earth happens. That's when I experience his fullness. That's when I get there. This whole Christian thing. It is a practice in growth and change. And listen, church, we've got to be people who grow and change. Sometimes I find myself thinking, man, I need to say that when I'm up here. But then I've got to test and see if it's the Holy Spirit or just me. But listen, we've got to be people of growth and change, not just individually, but corporately. That got fewer amens. Did you see that? We've got to be a church that is okay with growth and with change. All right? We church people, sometimes we, we, we don't like change. We don't like that word. You're changing it. You're changing it. What are you doing? Or the church is growing. I don't know as many people as I used to. Uh, what's going on? Listen, in the new year, let's put that aside. Let's not only be people individually that are okay with growth and change, but that corporately are okay with growth and change. Here's number two. If you're writing these down, you can follow along with me there. Setting goals is easy. Finishing them is hard. Setting goals is easy. Finishing them is hard. One of my favorite authors is John Acuff. If you don't know him, you can look him up. He wrote a book uh, called Stuff Christians Like. If you haven't read it, it's very funny. You may feel convicted and maybe offended, but uh, it's really funny. Uh, and actually, I think I have it in my office. But, uh, but anyway, he wrote a book, and he, 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 one, of his, one of his first books was a book called Start. And the whole idea of this book was helping people set goals and get started towards a better life and write that book you've always wanted to write and, and, and get healthy and lose weight and all of those things. He wanted to help people start. The interesting thing that he realized, as successful as that book was, it was a New York Times bestseller book. As successful as that book was, he realized that that wasn't the most important part of a changed life. The most important part of a changed life was finishing. 
So he just, he just, just came out, a book called Finish from him. And it's about finishing the goals that you set for yourself. Because listen, starting is easy. I can set goals all day long for myself. I could set a very long list of goals. When it comes to finishing them, that's where I get tripped up. I don't know about you, but I'm not a very good finisher. All of my adult years that I can remember, I've always set goals in the new years. I always set goals. I'm a, I'm a goal-minded person. If you know me at all, you probably know that about me. I, I love to set goals. Sometimes, sometimes leading in the new year, I'll set a long list of goals. Sometimes I'll just pick a couple of goals for myself. And it's definitely easier to set the goals, isn't it? I tend to think that if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. I also believe that life is meant to be lived intentionally and not accidentally. And I think that the reason that we have the Word of God is so that we can have an instruction book on how to live proactively. And not just to live by accident or to live by the things that happen to us. But we can be proactive people and we can, we can live in a way that honors God no matter what comes our way. Life is meant to be lived intentionally, especially the Christian life. But finishing is hard, isn't it? Finishing is hard, isn't it? You've been there, I'm sure I've been there. We've set goals, really good goals for ourselves. But two weeks or two months into the new year, or after we've set them for ourselves, we've completely given up on them. You know this as well as I do. Look at the gym next week. Go to the gym, look at it. It's going to be packed. It is going to be packed. People that are faithful to working out, they're like, I don't even like to go to the gym in January because it's so packed and nobody knows how to use the equipment. <laughs> but listen, by Valentine's Day, it's back to the way it was. Right? You've witnessed that before. So many true things. Finishing is hard. I want to challenge you to be a person who finishes and finishes well in the new year. And here's the truth, is that the closer you get to what God wants done in your life, the harder the enemy will battle back against you. And that makes it hard to finish. We have a very real enemy that doesn't want us to take spiritual steps. He doesn't want us to get closer to God. He doesn't want us to come to church more. He doesn't want us to encourage others. So he will battle and fight. And so we set goals, and those are easy. The enemy knows that. He's like, yeah, go ahead and set your goals. You can do that all day long. I don't care. But when it comes to doing them and finishing them, that's where he takes action. Second Timothy, I love these words, 4-7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He finished. He did it. He completed the race. It was a fight. I had to fight to get there. And listen, if you're looking for easy goals in 2018, they don't exist. If you have an easy goal, you probably should have picked a bigger one. Goals are hard. Growing in Christ is hard. But fight the good faith. Or fight the good fight of faith. Do it. You'll find that on the other side lies a reward for you. So for Christmas, I bought myself a present with my wife's permission. I bought an exercise bike for my home. Somebody said, wow. Thanks for your faith that you have in me. I needed somewhere else to lay my clothes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we got it, I don't know, probably a month ago. Is that right, Consuela? Maybe, maybe we had it for about a month or so. And, uh, and, and honestly, I, I have ridden that thing pretty consistently. Uh, I, I've not let more than a couple days pass by before getting back on it. And, and it's, that's really good for me. Uh, and uh, you remember I had my running shoes up here a couple weeks ago, and they were barely used? Well, now they're being used. I like it. Uh, but man, you know what the truth is? Is that every time before I get on that bike, I have to talk myself into it. Every single time. I, I have not had a day yet where I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get on that bike. Let's do it. No. I'm like, uh. And for me, I'm riding it at night. And so if you want to have a good excuse to not ride a bike, ride it at night. <laughs> so the kids are in bed. I, I lay down in bed. I'm staring at the bike because it's in my bedroom. <laughs> like, I really ought to, I really should get on that thing. 
I really need to get on that thing. Then I'd reach in my drawer and pull out the Hershey Christmas trees, you know, the Reese's Christmas trees that I have. Eat one of those. I should, I should, ah, not tonight. I'm not going to get on the bike tonight. Tomorrow I'll get on it. I'll wake up early tomorrow, right? Have you ever told yourself that lie? I'll wake up early tomorrow and get on it. No, that's not going to happen. It's a fight every time. And I, I, the, there, was, there, was, there was a quote from, from somebody, I can't remember who it is, but, but it, really, it, it really revolutionized my thinking, especially about weight loss, but it, but it applies to spiritual things as well, is this person was an accomplished runner. And they said, they said in this interview, they said, I don't like running. Like, it's, n- it's not a joy for me. But they do it because they know it's the right thing for them. It's a fight, but the end result is worth it. It's a fight, but the end result is worth it. So, here's point number three. This is where it takes a turn from, from bad to good, if you will. But we're not in this alone. Finishing, as hard as it is, it takes power beyond our own. I would submit to you that any goal that is worthwhile cannot be kept and cannot be accomplished without the Holy Spirit's help, especially when it comes to spiritual goals. I heard it put this way one time, living in your own strength, it's kind of like pushing a car instead of driving it. Kind of like pushing a car instead of driving it. Yeah, there can be progress, but it's slow, it's inconsistent, and it's extremely inefficient. As long as you are pushing the car, there are places that you simply can't go. There are hills that you cannot climb. There are vistas that you'll never reach. And at times, it takes every bit of strength you have just to keep from losing ground. As long as you are pushing your car, there is no joy and no sense of satisfaction. It's certainly not something that you look forward to. And doesn't life feel like that sometimes? And don't we buy into that lie? I mean, with spiritual things, we can see it so clearly, can't we? Well, yeah, if I'm going to read my Bible more, yeah, sure, I need the Holy Spirit to help me do that. But if I'm going to lose weight, that's up to me. Like, I got myself into this mess, I need to get myself out of it. Or if I'm going to have better relationships, I've got to do it on my own. I've got to be the one that goes and, and does these things. But I think, I think that we've got a Holy Spirit. We've got a helper for us that will help us no matter what we're going through. And so we've got to get in the car and drive. And let the Holy Spirit be the one that takes us there. The Holy Spirit wants to help you. The Holy Spirit wants to help me. He was sent as a helper. But we have to engage Him. And we have to, we have to allow Him to help and lead us. Far too many of us have an unhealthy view of the Holy Spirit. Some of us think that the Holy Spirit is only there for the spiritual parts of our lives, so we only engage Him with those things, or we only engage Him when we find ourselves in trouble in life. Others of us, others of us, well, we need to hear this, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. It makes me better than me. The Holy Spirit is here to help us be a better version of ourselves. The Holy Spirit is here so we don't walk this life alone. 1 John says it very clearly, chapter 5, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Overcomes the world. How many of you want to overcome the world today? And part of overcoming the world is dealing with you. Overcoming your flesh, overcoming your desires, overcoming the things that tempt and tease you. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? I love it when I ask the question. Who is it? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's be overcomers. Let's be overcomers of this world. Galatians chapter 5, you know it well. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. How is it that we accomplish those things in our lives? By having more and more of the Holy Spirit in our lives. By allowing the Holy Spirit to have room and space in our lives to guide us, to direct us, to, to correct us when we're going off path. 
And I don't know about you, but, but maybe this list from Galatians chapter 5 could be your list of to-dos for the, to, for the new year, for 2018. And I love that self-control is in there. I think my biggest problem in life is self-control. I think that's my biggest problem. Maybe I have problem, big problems with these other things too. But self-control, for the purposes of this message, is going to be my biggest problem. I'll pick the others at another time. I, I, I just gave you an illustration of eating Reese's trees. I'm not lying about that. They're in my drawer next to my bed. My son just said, yes, they are. <laughs> if you want to see my lack of self-control, buy me some donuts. I mean, it's, it's an easy practice in my lack of self-control. Maybe you find that you lack self-control. And the way, that I, the way that I feel okay with my lack of self-control is that I, is that I use entitlement. I feel entitled. It, you know, I'm a, I'm a grown man. I can eat a donut if I want to. So I said, hey, Ben. <laughs> right? I, you've been there. Am I the only one? You guys are like looking at me like, man, pastor, we're going to pray for you. I feel entitled to these things. I feel like I deserve them somehow. I feel like it's my right to them. And listen, I joke, I joke about food. But listen, I want you to think for a minute. What's your excuse? What's, what's your reason for the things that you shouldn't be doing that you do? For me, I, I, I like to sleep in doesn't happen very often, but I was on vacation this week, and it was, it was a pretty good week. But sleep can quickly become my excuse for not getting into the Word. Oh, I'm tired. God understands. I'm tired. More out. Tomorrow, God. Tomorrow. What is it for you? What's your entitlement that you have in life where you say, well... I've, I've earned that. I deserve that. I'm grown, and I should be able to do that. Because the depth, the places that you'll go with God are only going to be as deep as your ability to turn your back on entitlements and excuses for your life. And these things happen by having more and more of the Holy Spirit in your life. Proverbs 16.3. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. Whatever it is that, that, you, that you want to do in the new year, start by committing it to God. Write down your list. Pray over it. Give it to God and say, God, these are the things that I feel like you're guiding me toward, but I'm not going to get there on my own. These are God-sized goals. These are goals that at the end of the year I want to achieve them, but I can't do it on my own. So will you help me? And if they're good goals, I guarantee He will help you. We see right here, He will establish the plan. He will guide you there. He will get you there. Commit them to God. Because listen, the truth is, is that no matter what goal you're setting for yourself, if it's to get better in the new year, He wants to help you. He wants to help you get there. And far too often, too many of us, we try to do it on our own. So, worship team, you can come back up. Here's my last point. Commit. Commit to make 2018 a year of growth for you. Probably the most profound bullet point I've ever written. Commit to make 2018 a year of growth. Can you do that? Are you in with me on this? Because listen, a church is only as healthy as the people that are sitting in it. 
And as your pastor, I know some of you are new, but as your pastor, I want to encourage you with everything that I have and everything that I am to grow spiritually in this new year. Grow spiritually. Assess where you are and take a step to grow. Because listen, we all have growth to do. We all do. And so for some of us, it's the usual. I want to get healthy. I want to better steward my money. I want to spend more time with family and less time with electronics. I want to do better at school. I want to get better at relationships with, with my spouse, with my kids, with my friends, my extended family, my coworkers, and my neighbors. Those are the usual things. For others, for some, it's deeper things. Like finding the ability to forgive that person that's hurt us or hurt our family so deeply. Or it's dealing with that addiction that has haunted us for too long. Or for some, it's, it's letting go of that hurt, that offense that I've held on too long. In fact, it's that hurt or offense that I've convinced myself I'm entitled to hang on to. And then for everyone, everyone that's here today, there are spiritual goals that I want to encourage you to set for yourself. Things like prayer, Bible study, time with God, small group involvement, being evangelistic in your everyday. That's a big one. I'm going to preach a series on that one next year. Being evangelistic. For everyone, a good goal is to grasp God's grace more fully in your life. For everyone, it's stepping out on faith more often and trusting God completely no matter what's going on around you. Proverbs 16, 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Plans. Make plans. And then rely on God. Psalm 24. May He give you the desire of your heart and make all of your plans succeed. That's a blessing for you today. So, as you embark on 2018, as you leave from here today, as you're eating a meal with those you love most, as you stay up till midnight so you can pray in the new year, so you can kiss your loved one as the, as the ball drops, I want to ask you and invite you to set some goals for 2018. Growth to succeed. Growth, goals, goals to succeed. Goals to growth. Goals to get better. Here, here are some more specific ones maybe you would set a goal to be a more thankful person or to be a more forgiving person or to be a more generous person a goal to be a person that has more character and integrity to be more involved in the life of your church by the way growth track next week it's a great place to start but church attendance on Sunday is too. Or maybe you would once again assess where you're at. Assess your spiritual disciplines. What are those habits that you have in your life that you've developed over time that help you get closer to God and closer to the person God wants you to be? And then take another step and go deeper. And listen, you've got to write these out. Have you heard of SMART goals? S-M-A-R-T, SMART goals? It's a great way to do goal setting. I didn't put it on the screen, but it's specific. So be specific about the goals you set. Don't be general. I listed some general ones for you. Don't use those. Make them more specific. Make sure that they're measurable. 
tie a number to them. You're going to do something over this period of time, or you're going to do this this many times, or, you know, like, like exercising. I know that, that Consuelo and I, we've set this goal to where we're not going to let more than two days pass before we get back on the bike. That's, that's a measurable goal. We can measure that. Uh, the A, some, some people say it different ways, attainable or achievable. Uh, so make sure that it's something you can actually do. Uh, R is, uh, let's see, somebody help me with R. Realistic is one way. It's kind of, that's kind of the same as the A, um, but there's another R word. What was it? Repeatable. Is that what you said? Yeah, repeatable. Uh, and so something that you can actually not just do once, but over time. Uh, and then T is time sensitive. So do it over a period of time. Like set, set yourself. And listen, for 2018, these don't have to be goals that like are, are all the way up until the end of the year. I think that's sometimes what our failure is. I think sometimes we commit to do things over an entire year and then we trip up along the way and we get discouraged and we give up. So take it in chunks. Maybe something you would just do, say, hey, just in the month of January, I'm going to do this. And then you'll be amazed that by February how much easier this is for you. And then March it becomes even easier. But set yourself some goals. One of the goals that I'm inviting you to do, I don't know if you got one of these on the way in, but uh, is to read through your Bible every day. And so these Bible reading plans, if you didn't get one, they're sitting over there on the counter as you leave. But I've outlined Scripture reading for every day of the new year. Actually, this is just the first six months. We'll publish the second six months later in the year. First six months, every day. In fact, on Sundays, they're kind of a catch-up or break day. So really, it's only six out of seven days of reading. One of, the, one of the biggest stats that I see in church world is that our biblical literacy is going down and down with each year that passes. Christians are no longer biblically literate. The percentages are staggering. People don't know what the Bible says. Why? Because they're not reading the Bible. If you only come in here on a Sunday and get my six to eight verses, you're not getting enough Bible. You've got to dig in. And one of the best ways to do that, i found, is to read through the entire Bible in the year. Wouldn't that be a great, a great goal to achieve next year? To be here on this day next year and say, I read through the whole Bible this year. That's cool. I've done that a couple times. It is, it's a good feeling. But you know what it does is it grows your biblical literacy. So there's kind of a double benefit there for yourself. And I believe, if you'll allow him, God speaks to you every time you open the Bible. He always has something to say to you. And so this Bible reading plan, uh, it's, it's pretty much uh, Old Testament, New Testament, and then like a psalm or a proverb, for the most part, until you get to the later part of the year. So it kind of gives you a, a variety. I've read chronologically through the Bible. That's, that's an interesting way to read through if you read through time. So like the book of Job actually happens back in the time of Genesis. Most people don't know that. So if you read chronologically, you'll actually read Genesis and then Job, and then... Read for it. So that's kind of interesting, right? So you learn cool things like that as you read through the Bible. Uh, and so maybe you want to have a commentary with you. There's lots of ways to do it. We're going to talk about this more in the new year. But biblical literacy, it's important to the Christian life. Because how can you grow towards something you don't know? It's a big amen point right there. I know it's a simple message. Maybe it's not very evangelistic or spiritual. I don't know. I thought it was appropriate for today. So I want to invite you to, to commit right now. Commit to make 2018 your year. Make it your year. And you know what that means? That means that no matter what happens in 2018, it's still your year. If you commit to it, you can face the biggest storm in life. There are so many testimonies right here in this room right now of people that faced amazing things in 20, 2017 that they got through. And they did it with excellence. They did it well. And they would tell you, you can do it. You can make it your year no matter what you've been through. For far too many of us, we get to the end of another year and we find ourselves disappointed, don't we? We look back and we only see the things we didn't do. Don't do that. Don't do that. Today, in addition to committing to making 2018 your year, commit right now to say, you know what? 2017, it's in the books. Just like Paul said, I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to look back to the things behind me. I'm going to look ahead. 
Maybe there's lessons there you need to learn. That's great. Do that. But do not find yourself dwelling on the past. Move forward. Because the new year brings new opportunity. Don't dwell on the past. Set some goals. Commit to finishing them. Give yourself some grace if you mess up along the way. Tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. And understand that 2018 can be your year of growth, change, success, more of God. Are you with me? Let's make it our best year. Man, people that weren't here today, they missed out, didn't they? Here's what I want to ask you to do right now. Go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe if you, as you've been listening to me, you would, you've evaluated yourself and you've said, man, yeah, I, I, I've realized that, that I need some things to change about my life. And as you've thought about that, you've, you've realized that, man, I, I've been trying to do this thing without God. Maybe you once knew him and you've, you've, you found yourself distant from him. Or, 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 or maybe you've never known him. And you want 2018 to be your year. I would submit to you that it starts with God. It starts with a relationship with him. And so if that's you, if you've not taken that step of saving faith in Jesus Christ, you've not taken that step of salvation, I want to give you that opportunity right now, December 31st, 2017. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, if you'd like to take that step today, will you just lift up your hand? I'm going to lead you in a quick prayer. And then, and then and, and, and that's it. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. But I want to know who I'm praying with. So if that's you, if you'd like to take that step of saving faith in Jesus Christ right now, just lift up your hand. I'll say I see your hand. You can put it right back down. Anybody anywhere want to take that step today? All right, with every head still bowed and every eye closed still. If you are a person that would say, Pastor, I, 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 I need some things to change in 2018. I, I want 2018 to be my year, and, and, and I, want, I, I need some things to change. Will you just raise your hand? I just want to see who, who would say, yes, I need some things to change this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can put your hands back down. You can, you can look back up this way. Everybody, just go ahead and stand to your feet. And you know, the worship team, they're going to they're gonna begin, they're gonna begin to play. One of the things that, I want to do a couple things right now in this moment. You guys can worship and pray at the same time, right? Do you guys know you can do that? That's kind of a cool thing if you can do that. You, you, you can do that. A couple things. First, tap, God is here. My, my, my biggest concern is that right now, so many of you say, yeah, I need things to change. But then you're going to walk out and you're going to see your kids and your family and your home and the things that you, that you walked away from this morning or maybe you're not near to right now and things are going to look very familiar and you're not going to shift. You're not, you're not going to fully allow what I've said today to be placed in your heart. And God is with you. But man, He is present here right now. And so I, I just want to encourage you. Ask God right now to speak to you. And to tell you specifically what it is that He wants you to do in the new year. What goal is it? Or what goals are there that He wants you to set for the new year? Ask Him. And then listen. When you get home today or tonight, maybe you want to make it a family ordeal. Write, sit down and write out your goals. Maybe it's just one goal. That's fine. Set it. Write it down. Maybe you have, maybe you have, I wouldn't set more than like five goals, by the way. But, but maybe you have five goals. Write them down and then pray over them. Commit them to God and then he will establish the plan. But I don't want you to leave this moment until you've asked him what it is that he wants you to do in the new year. Because I believe he'll speak to you. So, so if you'll do that, the band, they're going to begin to play. But then here's the second thing. Here in just a moment, I want to invite you out of your seats. 
I did this before and it didn't go well. But I'm going to do it again. Because I'm trusting you guys today. There's nothing special about this front area. But I think it's a great way to end our year together as the Journey Church. That, that we would all just move from our seats to the front. And that we would just sing as one voice. We would worship God as one, as one body. And that we would just be together. Signifying unity. And praising our Heavenly Father. So, after they've sang for a minute. If you'll just move from your seat and begin to find a place up here to worship. And then I'll come back out and I'll close this up. Alright? Is that a deal? Alright. Let's do it.